Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Karen DeWolf. I am the VP of Regulated Industries here at Aprimo. I could not be happier to be hosting this webinar topic today. Mission Critical Content Strategy, Navigating Compliance and Personalization for Government Agencies with my partner and co-presenter, Emily Crockett from Enterprise Knowledge. Welcome, Emily. Thank you for having me, I'm so excited. Yes, yeah, super excited to have this discussion. We've got a lot to talk about in 30 minutes, Emily, and we know this is going to go by really fast. A couple of things before we get started from a housekeeping perspective, please submit any questions you have in the Q&A box. We will be answering questions in real time as they come in, if at the appropriate time. We'll also answer them at the end of the session if time permits, and we certainly hope we get to all of your questions. If there are any that we don't get to, we will still respond to all of those after the conclusion of this so everybody gets all of the information that they need. So make sure to do that. Also, please make sure to fill out our short survey that will appear once the session is concluded. It's going to give us the ability to know what you'd like for future webinars that we do. And it's really going to give us the information we need to be able to serve you better for content you'd like from us in the future. Also look out for a government starter pack that will be delivered uh, via the chat, also in an email follow-up afterwards. All right, Emily, are we ready? Here we go. There's a lot of content for us to get to here. The first thing that we'd like to talk about here is how important is content for government agencies? And this is why we're here, right? Because content is king of everything these days. And we all know how ubiquitous content is these days. Organizations from across the globe in every vertical, from pharma to banking to government to CPG to travel and tourism, all of them are trying to get their content seen and they're trying to get their content to stand out. The best way to get your content to stand out and be consumed and to cut through all of the noise is for you to have a content strategy. Most major players have a formal one of some sort. But what about government agencies? Do they have these strategies? Do they work the same as all of the enterprise organizations out there in putting the time, energy, and resources around making sure that a content strategy is in place? Well, first, what we want to do is talk about what role content plays for you. And then we'll talk about what it looks like for government agencies in having these strategies. So the first thing you need content for is to make sure that you're informing and educating your citizens. You produce a wide range of content that's going to give all of your audience information about maybe their rights and responsibilities, government programs and services, and important public policy issues. You also use content to build trust and credibility. Government agencies in particular need to build this trust and credibility in order to be effective. You need to have high quality content that can help you demonstrate your expertise and really your commitment to having transparency and accountability. You also need to engage. Government agencies need to make sure that citizens, your audience, in order to get all of the information, you are engaging them. And you're doing that by providing content, by building support for programs and services, and using the content through social media, through email newsletters, online surveys, in posters, and in, in maybe national parks, and all sorts of other channels. But really, a lot of the content that you're creating is to make sure that your audience is getting engaged. Also, for you to promote innovation. You need to have the ability to share your best practices, your case studies, and other resources with other agencies and with the public so that people know that you're right there at the forefront of all innovation and things that are moving forward. You're also using content to build a community. Government agencies in particular use content to make sure that their programs and services are being seen and it's helping to increase that citizen participation and to make government more responsive to the needs of the public. So let's talk a little bit about where you all sit in terms of the numbers. I've pulled some statistics here that are from some various very credible sources. 
If you take a look at what we're looking at here, that only 29% of government agencies have a centralized content hub, which means that you have a digital asset management system or some way of aggregating all of the content that you have. That leaves an awful lot that don't. You've got 29% of state governments have a budget for content marketing. That's not a lot. 42% of government agencies have a documented content strategy, which means that most don't. And without going through all of these, I think you can see a theme here. Typically what we're seeing is that government agencies have the same needs of content. You've got the same desire to get all of your content seen by all of the public, but you've got an inability to put some of the programs and systems in place that's going to help you be, get there and be successful with it. Emily, is this something that you've seen a lot and what you do on a daily basis as well? Yeah, no, absolutely. We're, we're definitely seeing kind of a focus on document management rather than a holistic knowledge strategy or a strategy around data. And unfortunately, we're seeing that um, government or organizations are generally behind the private sector, which is a shame because ultimately you're going to um, benefit more, I think, from this strategy than even private organizations would. I would agree with that 100%. So now that we know that all of this content is important to us and we know that we are not doing everything we probably could be to get our content strategy to where it should be, let's talk a little bit about what some of those common barriers are for you to put a content strategy in place that's really going to take you forward. A lot of this isn't going to be news to the folks on the call, but let's go through this. The first one we have here are content silos. So content silos means that you've got multiple departments and teams that create and manage their own content. Much of what you just said, Emily, where people are managing their own little microcosm of the world. And what that does is it puts your content in different places, it's different systems and man managed by different teams. There's also inconsistent content. Typically what happens is that the tone, the style, the voice, and all of those can be different if it's not centralized, if it's not managed with an overall strategy that everybody has input into. The result of that is that it can make it confusing or difficult to navigate. This one's an interesting one because the outdated content here, government content is typically not updated regularly, which can lead to the people who are trying to consume it either being misinformed or having difficulty finding the information that they need. On the previous slide, we saw that it's a significant amount of government content that goes uh, that isn't updated and is outdated. This is something that from a compliance standpoint and from an informational standpoint really needs to be looked at so that you have a way of managing all of the content that you do have and knowing that it's up to date. A lot of it is, inaccept, uh, is inaccessible and there's that lack of content strategy that we just spoke about. So what are some of the unique challenges that happen for you as well? There's a complex regulatory environment. Government agencies must comply with a complex set of regulations, which can make it difficult to create and manage this without a strategy, without a process, and without workflow. I don't have to tell all of you this either, limited resources. This isn't unique to government. However, I put it in here because it's a little bit more challenging these days and then in some others. Government agencies often have limited resources to devote to content creation and management. That's something that we all need to work through. How do we get the same amount of content into the world with less resources to get it done? And of course, there's public scrutiny. Government content is subject to a high level of public scrutiny because it's out there, it's being seen, which can make it difficult for organizations that are in the sector to be able to experiment and innovate like some other, say, CPG companies might be able to do. So what I'd like to do right now is take you through what it looks like when your content is the center of your communication universe. This is what we call Content 360. I'd like you to take a look at the product in the middle of this slide. All of the data on the left is information related to this product. And when I say product, it doesn't matter if you're in consumer goods, government, life sciences, retail, finance, tech, you name it. We all have a good or a product or service 
that we want to get out there into the world and that we're promoting. And there is a ton of data that goes with each of these products of ours. So when you look at all of this, use of a digital asset management and knowledge management platform give you the ability to start looking at all of your content in this 360 degree view. There are massive amounts of data here and you might not even realize you have it and you also might not realize that you need it. All of this data can then be used to automate, improve, drive and enhance all of the downstream systems, people, infrastructure, and outputs that need that content information to fuel all of your future communications. This slide is the reason that having a content strategy is so important. This is why having digital asset management is so important. One central location to house the massive amounts of data to be the hub of all of these inputs and outputs this is why having a knowledge center is so important. Think of each piece of content not as a static finished product, but more as a central nervous system of information. This brings the data, the applied uh, compliance that you need to have to get content out into the world. It manages your usage rights, and it helps you push data out at every end and touch point. And now I want you to think for a moment about what happens when we layer in AI into this whole conversation. As the amounts of data that we're gathering about every product and every piece of content we have grows, we start to get even more and we need AI to help us achieve better, more informed results going forward. AI and generative AI allows us to consume this data, make sense of it, and provides us with the information and tools we need to be more efficient and more targeted as we go forward. Using AI responsibly in self-contained data sets allows us to be more accurate on brand and with safer results. Consuming and analyzing this amount of data in this way that humans alone could never do on their own. This is content intelligence that you get from one single asset, one single product. And all of this data provides us with real opportunities to be able to act smarter and faster when, we're, when our goal is delivering meaningful content experiences out to each of our markets. Emily, I'd like to bring this full circle for everyone. How does knowledge management round out this 360 degree view with the enormous amounts of data that are available to us all? Absolutely. Um, so just to set the stage here a little bit, EK, uh, Enterprise Knowledge, we're the largest dedicated knowledge management consultancy in the world. And you can read more about us on our website. But the reason I wanted to show this slide is to direct your attention to the area of expertise. You should see terms that you're familiar with from DAM, like taxonomy, search, change management. So much of this overlaps to create that 360 degree view. So on this next slide, we're gonna talk about um, a case study that we had here at EK. Karen, if you could hit the slide, thank you. Um, so we had the opportunity at EK to work with uh, the State Department Operations Center, who's tasked with monitoring world events on a 24 seven basis to keep personnel, executive leadership and other stakeholders up to date on world events faster than they would get information from the news. To perform their mission, ops required a highly reliable system that would allow users to quickly and collaboratively draft, review, publish reports, and then directly to multiple channels like email and web. So they were meeting their consumers where they were. Um, obviously, this is a highly time sensitive and mission critical process. And when we first started working with this agency, that process was relying heavily on copy and paste, which is both time consuming and highly error prone. After extensive top-down, bottom-up analysis, we were able to work with stakeholders to define both business and technical requirements and needs. And then we developed a solution, Stoic, um, that created a componentized content strategy that allowed for collaborative authoring and multi-channel publishing system. So the content was modularized, uh, meaning that it's stored and tagged as segments of the com content, as opposed to being stored again at that document level. Um, this enables the ability for users to receive smaller pieces of relevant information rather than whole documents. 
Users can search for and subscribe to specific topics that they're interested in. And then in return, they only have that information returned to them. Um, for example, there might be one segment in an ops product related to Ukraine, but the rest of the document has other updates about other countries. Um, in this example, a user would be more interested, of course, in, in receiving the information about Ukraine. And so when they perform a search, um, they can quickly pinpoint just that segment instead of finding the entire document and then visually parsing through it. Um, and then this modularized content allows for multi-channel publishing. Uh, you're able to pull the same content and then configure it for that channel. So it's not copies on copies. And again, if we're thinking about information as documents, as content, as a 360 view. Uh, so using that new system, they were able to complete the publication workflow 20% faster on their, than their old process. And the average time to inbox went from 76 minutes to one minute which means that the users and the public servants that needed that information can make the decisions quickly. In this wireframe, you can see how the search results, which like I mentioned earlier, would have been snippets or segments, but you can also see this idea of a knowledge panel, kind of like what Google uses, um, powered by a graph. And the system is essentially pulling that information, pulling that knowledge, and it's also grabbing related digital assets. Um, this is all possible by keeping content at the center and a strong synergy between knowledge man management and digital asset management. So on this next slide, I'm going to talk a little bit about what knowledge management is because um, it might be unfamiliar. So the definition that we use at EK uh, is knowledge management involves the people, processes, content, culture, and enabling technologies necessary to capture, manage, share, and find information. That's probably pretty familiar, again, from the damn world people process platform, something that's used over and over again. But with KM, we're really wanting to think about culture and how um, all, of, all the people involved are really um, supporting that mission. Ultimately, we're striving to bring the right knowledge and content to the right people at the right time in the right medium. The point of knowledge management and content management is to enable action by employees, customers, partners, constituents, not just now and in our current moment, but also into the future for organizational memory and longevity. Uh, the story I always tell to highlight the importance of KM is a personal one. Uh, growing up, my mom worked for a Fortune 5 automaker and did a bunch of jobs while there, but the one that's really relevant is when she was in parts and logistics, and she would go to warehouses and evaluate processes, um, and then she would have to break the news to people that there was a potentially catastrophic event that could occur if they didn't think about knowledge management. And the example she would use is, okay, so Bob over there is managing Oceanside Logistics, and he's the only person that knows how that process works. So what happens when Bob retires? What happens if Bob wins the lottery? What if, God forbid, Bob dies? Without Bob, transatlantic shipping would screech to a halt while everyone scrambles to figure out how job Bob did his job. Um, and that's something you have to think about, particularly in the government, where people are staying longer than they are in the private sector. Um, when you think about the brain drain and, and people leaving, you need to capture that knowledge and that content and um, be able to, to move it on to the next generation. So in this next slide, we're going to talk a little bit more about those action verbs um, that are at the end of this definition. So... Again, we're seeing action verbs, we're capturing, we're managing, sharing, and finding. Um, I think a lot of these actions are also ones that you're seeing in DAM. What do you think, Karen? Do you see customers performing all of these actions? They do, and I think that's why it's so important that there's this synergy between the things that we're talking about. And it's having a content strategy in place with your DAM, with your knowledge management, and having that one 360-degree view of everything that you have, because to your point, everything has to be housed somewhere and it can't be housed everywhere. If you do that, you have chaos. So you will see, you know, in both of our talk tracks, Emily, it's, a, it's creation, it's capturing, it's managing it, it's enhancing it. And it's making sure that we've got centralized locations for all of this massive amount of data. Absolutely. And you touched on a point that 
I wanted to hit here of um, this particular one enhancing of thinking about the sustainability. And I think anyone that's ever been in a dam or a CMS or any other type of repository can agree that content's natural state is chaos, it's disorder and high entropy. Um, but if you have strategy and governance processes, you can counteract that. Um, so I think just like a dam isn't a set it and forget it, you've done dam, now you're done. You have to work to sustain and improve your assets so that users can trust the content that they're getting. Um, you wanna avoid any feeling of dumpster diving by your users that they don't know what they're getting and don't know how to um, manage and find information to take action. So on this next slide, uh, we're gonna take a, talk a little bit about how DAM and KM can work together. And it's blurry, it is. Um, and ultimately they share the same DNA. They're used together to create a powerful force, um, but what could that look like in practice? Uh, one, one example I was thinking about is like in a regulatory agency, thinking about the knowledge and the content and the assets and how what all that does coming together. It may look like alerting a constituent to a change in policy, so some knowledge, and you might do that via a brief or a web page or maybe even an infographic. And you want that man manifestation of that knowledge of the policy and its related assets to stay in sync. So both um, internal and external audiences, again, can trust the content that they're getting and feel like they can make a decision on it in a timely manner. They don't have to worry about it being old or outdated. Um, they can trust that it's, it's up to date. And so when a user is in the dam or in a knowledge management system, you want them to be able to accomplish that task. Um, content's so much more than just the finished product, like a, a blog or a video clip. It's it's all of it. It's the 360 degree view. Like we keep, keep repeating because it's so important. Um, and so thinking about all of this, this strategy, when you're really, again, thinking about the holistic um, the holistic coming together. It facilitates reuse, personalization, and multi-channel delivery. Um, and when we're thinking about reuse, we're not just talking again about copy and paste. We're thinking about content that can be linked so that if something changes, it'll flow to all the places that it's used. It's a single point of update, which is so important when you're dealing with compliance or with frequently changing information or content you need to be aware of everything that's out there um, so that you can edit, update, or take down at the drop of a hat. Um, and so one other thing we're going to talk about is, is content personalization. Uh, sometimes, like we saw in our, our case study, is that means honing in on what your user wants and uh, what they've come to your organization to accomplish um, and showing relevant information that's relevant to them and sensitive to their needs. So that may look like if your user is logged into a system, they've filled out a form on disaster assistance. This may not be the time to show them information or content around preventative measures that um, may, for a lack of a better phrase, kick them while they're down. You want to know kind of how to best support your users, both in good times and bad, and how to really be sensitive to their needs. Um, and so I think with all of that, and again, with multi-channel delivery, you're thinking about breaking content out of PDFs. A white paper appears on an agency's website about a policy change, and it's on the web page, and it's on the PDF. And if something changes, the PDF is locked down. Um, and you want that content, again, to be able to think about that full life cycle of where it's going, what different information products it's going to, and how to create that single source of update. Um, and so with all of that, <laughs> we're thinking about this, this agile workforce and how to respond to a changing world. Um, and I think with that, we're ready to transition to some key takeaways and what you can do today to start on this journey. Definitely. And Emily, I just want to echo what you were saying, because I think back to when we were all in 2020 and the world sort of tilted and shifted with COVID. Every single organization on the planet, whether it be a product, the government, um, software companies, retail companies, paper towel companies, right? Everybody had to create new content immediately and had to create 
a knowledge database immediately and needed to be able to have everyone access the right information to everything that you're saying here, having everything organized and integrated to have internal information, external information, get it out in a timely manner. And I feel as though the way that the world is now, information comes quicker and the reaction that we all need to have to it also comes quicker. So in this changing world, we all need to be able to react on a dime. And I think having the systems in place to do that are going to be paramount to make sure that when things do happen, we are fully equipped to deal with them. And I think you'd probably agree with that. Yes. <laughs> so just a couple of takeaways that we want to give to everyone. There's a lot to doing this. This isn't something that you just wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to create a content strategy. I'm going to create a, a knowledge management um, center of excellence, and I'm going to get this all out into the world. There are some things that you really need to do. The first one that you want is to define your goals and objectives. And hopefully we've outlined the why for you. You want to make sure that you have measurable goals for your content strategy that align with the overall mission and objective of your particular agency or your workforce. You want to identify your target audience for all of your content, understand their needs, their preferences, behaviors, and supplement all of that with the knowledge that you have. You need to thoroughly do a, and conduct a content audit, you need to know what you have. You need to know if you have outdated content. You need to know if you have content that needs updating or just needs to be sunset altogether because it isn't relevant anymore. And you need to look at it all across all of the channels, including your websites, your social media, your printed materials, your digital platforms, to make sure that it's all cohesive and that it all goes together. You need to develop a governance framework. This is probably one of the more important things that we can talk about. And Emily and I would both be happy to follow up with anyone who wants more information about this, but it's making sure that you've got clear guidelines and procedures for the content creation, the publishing, the review, the approval, and then all of that data that goes around it. You need to make sure that you've got roles and responsibility for this content and the relationship of it and the management of it so that you don't find yourself in a year's time or two years time or 10 years time in the same situation where you haven't kept up up to date with everything that you have. It is important for you to create a consistent style guide. And what do I mean by that? It's having a recognizable voice and tone for all of your communications. And that's really making sure that you don't have a whole bunch of different ways that you're speaking from your written content, the way that you, you know, whether it's friendly or formal or things of that nature, you really want to make sure that you hone in on the way that your um, your audience wants to be communicated with and that you stick with that pattern. You also want to prioritize content creation in your organization. I know resources are difficult. I know sometimes it's hard to put the effort forth to this, but you need to have the most critical and frequently accessed content, get your immediate attention, make sure it's updated, make sure you have a plan for it. How do you do this? Make sure that you have a content calendar. A formal content planning tool can help you here to plan and schedule the content creation and publication process so that you're not just doing things one off and something that you know happens to come up in a particular week where you have time. Make sure that you have a plan for it in a content uh, plan that has a content calendar. And make sure that you're distributing your content effectively. Choose the most appropriate channels for reaching your audience. Yours is not going to be the same as someone else's. You need to make sure that you have online and offline um, options for folks. And you want to utilize all of the media that are out there for you because the more channels you use, the more opportunity you have for people to see. And the thing that Emily and I are, are both trying to make sure that we impress upon everybody is monitoring and evaluating the performance is probably one of the most important things you can do. And you probably hear this throughout your business on a day-to-day -day basis. If it's worth doing, it's worth measuring. You want to make sure that you're regularly looking at the data to identify the trends, to measure impact, to make informed decisions about everything you're doing. And your content strategy should be ever evolving. You need to make sure that you're taking all of the feedback, you're taking all of that information back in, and you're making it actionable intelligence for yourself and for your organization that you're not just doing the same things because you've always done them. You need to look at the data, find out what the data is telling you, and then adapt because that data is telling you to go a particular direction. 
using these key takeaways, it is going to give you the ability to put a framework in place so that you do have a content strategy and that you're not one of those, you know, more than 60% of organizations who don't have a defined process to get to get the eye and ear of the people that you need to get the eye and ear of. So with that, I know we're coming to the bottom of the hour here, but I know that we want to have um, a couple of questions here, Emily. So a couple of things that I think I just want to ask first and foremost, I think the main question most people ask is, where do you get started? How do you start putting knowledge management in place so that you can take advantage of all there is to offer? Yeah, for sure. I think one of the the key points kind of going back to that culture aspect of KM is um, getting a champion, you know, finding your cheerleaders, finding who will support the effort. Um, so you can really kind of get everyone on board. I think you identify your stakeholders. You really think about the people that would be involved. And then you go on a listening tour. Um, you may think you know what's wrong and you might be right, but it's important to get people involved at the beginning. Um, so they can, you know, air their grievances and you can think about ways to fix that. And then you can also really get them involved with change management at the beginning. It's not going to blindside them. It's going to, um, you know, they can think about it and get used to it because people don't like change. I mean, it's just a fact of life. So if you can do that listening tour and get people involved early, I think that's really the way to start and, and get things kicked off. I, I couldn't agree more. And one of the questions that I have over here is how can you measure the success of a content strategy once you put it in place? It's it's a great question. And I can tell you the first thing you need to do is create benchmarks. They might not be great benchmarks. Um, they might even just be anecdotal benchmarks that you get from asking people their opinion because oftentimes you don't have the metrics in place and that's why you don't have a content strategy. There's nothing that you've ever measured to before. So what I can tell you is benchmark where you are today and then create KPIs for yourself for you to measure against. Because once you're measuring towards something, you'll start putting attention to it. So things like measuring the traffic that you're getting, um, your engagement metrics, the inquiries you're getting, the time to market that it takes to get your content out, uh, what's your approval cycle time to get things out. Whatever you start with, it's going to give you exactly that, a starting point. And if you don't start measuring it from where you are, you'll never be able to see whether or not you've improved or not. Um, and I get asked quite often what the latest trends are in content marketing and how can you incorporate some of this new innovation. It's going to be things like using interactive content, using video content, of course, using AI um, and using semantic search type things so people can start finding your content with things that they're familiar with saying, hey, can you get me this, you know, X, Y, Z. Um, and micro content marketing is, is certainly out there as well, which is little bits of information instead of, you know, longer um, longer pieces that have been in creation and getting content out quicker in smaller snippets. So with that, Emily, I want to be mindful of everyone's time here. Are there any final thoughts that you would like to share? Uh, and then we will follow up with any other questions that we have here in chat afterwards, but I will give you the floor. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, I just, I'm so appreciative of this conversation and I really hope that, you know, this can trigger something for people and really think about how this can work in your organization and really um, think about ROI and also just how it supports mission and mandate. Um, often the job is to support the people and, and make things easy for them and make things, give the information to them as quickly as possible. And I think this synergy of KM and DAM really can support that and make it happen. I couldn't agree more. And I think what we should do, Emily, is keep this conversation going because what we're doing here is getting the conversation started for the folks on the line. Uh, this is really the, the high level of why you should be doing it. And you know all of the reasons out there and the amount of data that needs to be gathered. And I think a great follow-up for you and I is to have another session in the coming months to see where people are at and to help dig a little deeper in how to tactically start getting these things done and going. So I've really enjoyed this conversation with you. I know that we could go on and talk for a couple of hours on all of this. Um, so I'm looking forward to the next conversation we have where we can dig a little deeper. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me.
Thanks everyone. We're looking forward to our next session. Uh, please stay on for just a quick survey. If you have any questions at all about anything that we have gone over today, please feel free to reach out to Emily or myself and look for the follow-ups from Aprimo. Thank you very much, everyone.